Good evening. Welcome to the Magnus. My name is George Breslauer. I'm the faculty director of the Magnus. And um, it's really quite a privilege to be able to kick off our Great Stories series with Simon Goodman's story of his efforts, successful and continuing, to get back the hundreds of art pieces that were looted by the Nazis from his family's collections. Uh, through 10 years, 10 years of indefatigable effort on his part uh, to deal with private collectors, museums, governments and others throughout the world. It helped that he was able to work in German, French, Dutch, Italian, and English in studying the archives, studying correspondence in order to figure out how he could prove that these pieces belonged to his family, had been looted by the Nazis, and then had not been given back to his family. And that's the story he's going to tell us about tonight. It's a great pleasure to welcome Simon Goodman here and to welcome May Quigley, Simon's wife, and his son James, and other members of the Goodman clan who are here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Goodman. Thank you, Professor Breslau. It's a pleasure and honor to be here at the Magnus. Um, I have a great uh, Jewish story to tell, and no place better here, and it's uh, an honor, and thank you all for coming out tonight. It's uh, quite a long and complicated story, but I was able to condense it into just a few hundred pages. It took me, <laughs> um, there might be more to come actually, but uh, it's a story I didn't know anything about growing up. I, I was born in London just after the war. Here you see is my dear father in Switzerland, I think, um, well into his 70s. He was a strange man who never really talked much, um, was rather shattered by life, uh, traumatized, no doubt. Only safe subjects such as cricket would be really uh, <laughs> what we could talk about. The war was kind of off limits apart from a few very big British victories. Um, otherwise the Holocaust was definitely off the table. And um, I knew nothing really about his family. I knew vaguely, I deduced by the time I was a teenager that his parents had somehow died in the war, that um, they were sort of Jewish, and um, his grandfather had been a, a banker. Also that they owned a few paintings. No, I didn't really know what they were. Um, we had a few nice artworks in the house. Then, sadly, unexpectedly, my poor father dies at the age of 80. He drowns, actually, in uh, Venice, Italy. A few months later, his girlfriend amassed all these papers, documents he'd been hoarding ever since the end of the war, if not before, and piled them into these rather, um, bless you, beaten up cardboard boxes and shipped them to LA, where my brother and I live. They were full of old passports, um, letters. This one was from a famous French resistance heroine called Rose Ballon, who was played by Kate Blanchett in The Monuments Men. Um, she turned out the real Rose Ballon to be a great help to my father. There were documents like this, uh, proof that my grandfather had bought a Renoir landscape in Paris in the late 20s, and lots of photos of people I didn't know, and you know, had never known, never met. Growing up in London, we had really no, my, my mother had a bit of family, but my father had absolutely no family whatsoever, so it was kind of rather a lonely existence. Uh, and it was made even more lonely by not really having any roots, not quite understanding where I came from, who I was. Um, Eventually, it's taken me, actually, I, I took, 
uh, correct the professor that it's taken me 20 years to pe piece together this complicated story. And uh, I can now tell the story that my father wasn't able to tell me. It turns out that the family originated um, here in Bohemia. This is uh, the synagogue in Colin. It's just uh, 50 miles uh, east of Prague, where several generations of my family were, were the rabbis. So there was um, David Gutzmann, Isaac Gutzmann, Tobias Gutzmann. And then uh, Tobias, his grandson, actually decided to try his luck at banking. He moved uh, to the German, New German Federation uh, in Dresden, and uh, he was one of the leaders of the synagogue who, who built this wonderful new synagogue in uh, 1838. So interestingly, uh, it opened its doors exactly 100 years before Kristallnacht uh, in 1938, November 1938, I think, uh, when they burnt it down. So sadly, that's no longer there today. There's this rather awful concrete box to commemorate where it used to be. The, the family's collection evolves from this point. Uh, it began with uh, Jewish-themed beautiful pieces. This is uh, David with the Ark of the Covenant in gold and silver. There were other, here's, here's another beautiful piece. Actually now it's in the um, Met Museum in New York. Around the side you can see the, the, the 12 sons of Jacob, which would be, I guess, the, the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel. This lovely collection was financed by this fine bank here. Um, it started off as the Bunkhaus Bernhardt Gutzmann, who was my great-great-grandfather, and it evolved into the <coughs> Bank of Dresden, the Dresdner Bank. And uh, my great-great-great-grandfather, Bernhardt, retired great comfort here in this lovely castle in the hill overlooking Dresden. Um, he bought this castle as soon as the laws restricting Jews owning full uh, real estate throughout the Kingdom of Saxony were lifted. So this is not only a testimony to the success of my family and others during the emancipation period in Germany, the German Empire and the Austrian Empire, but it, it, you know, it's a testament to uh, the emancipation, uh, how, how quickly life changed, that we'd lived for generations and generations in this little village I don't want to call it a ghetto, there weren't gates, but um, effectively it was a ghetto. And in the 19th century, life changed dramatically. Everybody thought for the better. Um, this is where Bernhard Gutmann is buried in Dresden. You can see it's a miracle this cemetery has survived. Um, there's a rather solitary rabbi who still guards this. He was very happy to welcome me and my wife May doesn't get many visitors today. Um, you, you can see the marble has been attacked, but only slightly. It's, I was surprised that this was all there still. This survived Nazism, the Allied bombing, the, the firestorm of Dresden, uh, communist neglect, and then of course uh, East German skinheads with cans of spray paint and things worse. No doubt. Uh, anyway. This Bernhardt's son here is Eugen. This is my great-grandfather. He's the one who takes it to another level. The Bank of Dresden is moved to Berlin, the new capital of the new German Empire. You see, these are the new uh, corporate headquarters. They occupy the full city block. Uh, the Kaiser, Bismarck were there at the grand opening. and. Uh, Eugen had developed modern retail banking, so uh, accounts for every citizen, savings accounts, uh, branches throughout the country, branches eventually even in London, South America, Constantinople. And this is where they lived, in the Tiergarten. Sadly, the, this is the best I could find an architectural drawing. Um, 
most of our family letters, documents, and photos have disappeared, uh, no doubt, burnt, trashed during the war. Um, this was a happy home full of children and music teachers and lovely art. Um, here was my great-grandmother, Sophie, um, it was just a few of her pearls. Um, she, she was from another great banking family, the, the Warburgs of Hamburg, and um, a very resplendent lady. And um, Eugen, a little bit later in life, painted by uh, Max Liebermann, who was a great friend of his, the German-Jewish Impressionist painter. And um, this painting for a while was in the Jewish Museum in Berlin, at pride of place next to Albert Einstein. Um, he takes the collection in many new art collection in many new directions. He starts quite small with his beautiful little jewel box from Dresden as well by Johann Neuber. And then he expands to rather exotic things. You see this Nautilus shell from the Dutch East Indies, fashioned in gold by uh, goldsmiths, I think, from Antwerp in the early 1600s. Then there were many beautiful bronzes, this one by Adrian de Vries. And uh, as the title of my book uh, implies, there were many clocks. This is a, actually an automaton. If you wind it up, it still works. Um, the ostrich will flap its wings on the hour and the little party beats the drum. It was, it was my aunt Lily, who still, I'm very happy to say, alive in Italy. She's 96 now, survived the war. Um, this was her favorite. It's one of the few things she was allowed to touch as a little girl. And here you see my grandparents, uh, Fritz and Louise, in uh, the 20s in, in Paris, photographed by my dear old Man Ray, um, who, who indulged in society photography to pay for his uh, adventures in, in surrealism. Fritz, after the First World War, decided that Germany had become rather a strange and dangerous place, and he decided to settle in peaceful Holland, uh, which was a very smart move. Um, he made a fortune uh, in his own right. This was the home they moved to just west of Amsterdam. Called The house was called Bosbeek, outside a little town called Heemstede. And here was the one of the salons. You see a lot of maybe Chinese vases, Ming, Quinn, in every alcove, there were hundreds of them all, all over the house, very beautiful. This was the painted ceiling by uh, Jakob de Witt. They, the, not, the Germans tried to peel this out of the wall. Um, Göring had offered 50,000 Reichsmarks for it. It's, it's a miracle. It's back where it belongs. And here you see my grandmother in one of her many cars one of her sports cars here, with one of the, the Westies behind her. There were about 10 or so that roamed the estate. This was probably before she raced off to go shopping in Paris or Baden-Baden, wherever. And not to be outdone, here's my young aunt, aunt, young aunt at the time, Lily, um, with a perfectly working electric Bugatti <laughs> that uh, had been given by another banker called Fritz Mannheim who was the, the head of the Mendelssohn Bank at the time and a great family friend. My father, who you see him, was more Westies. He, he did get his Bugatti as well, not, you know, he would have been very upset yeah. otherwise. Um, it was an idyllic time in the 20s, even the early 30s, and the house was full of wonderful art. There's a Franz Hals that's now in the San Diego Museum. Um, there was this extraordinary memling, Madonna and Child. This was something that both Goering and Hitler fought over during the war. Hitler won, of course. And uh, there was even a, a Bosch. My grandfather had quite varied taste. Uh, this is now in the National Gallery of Canada. And there were several paintings by Luca Hanard. Here's one, by the way, I'm still looking for. If anybody seen this? <laughs> Facebook message me or anything, any, <laughs> carry a pigeon, whatever you like. Um, this one I'm, I'm still hunting for, no hide, no air since the war. 
And here you see the family. My, I still can try this. There's Eugen, um, probably in his 80s. That's my grandmother Louise, my great aunt Lily, one of the many poodles. They're all called Lord. Every time one died, one of the kids would go out and buy another poodle and they renamed him Lord. And my great grandfather pretended not to notice. <laughs> there, there's my grandfather Fritz. My great uncle, uh, Luca Orsini, who was an Italian senator, so he played a crucial role during the war. And my great uncle, Herbert, who, when Eugen died, Herbert assumed the presidency of the bank. Here he is, during his leisure time, um, president of the golf club, ironically named uh, the Wannsee Golf Club just across the little lake was uh, the, the villa where the dreaded uh, final solution was hatched. And uh, little did he know, obviously, at the time, you know, so Nero playing while Rome burns here, perhaps. Uh, he was kicked out of his own golf club. And uh, he was kicked out of the bank, you know, everything else. And, but his troubles weren't over. Here you see a Nazi election poster, Germans beware, these men are manipulating the government and they're the first, you know, uh, Jewish manipulator there is Guzman Dresnebank. They've misspelled our name, but, you know, up here are several other from Kaufmann Asse, um, Wahlberg, anyway, several cousins, relatives, we were all sort of singled out. We were what was wrong was the Weimar Republic. And so they were saying, you know, first right national socialist, vote for us and we'll get rid of these people. And um, as you see here, they, they did. Uh, a couple of years later, the bank is uh, under new management. And Herbert is able to escape with little more than um, the clothes on his back, honestly. You know, his wealth was stripped. And, uh, but he did get out with his life, which was in itself a, a great victory. But you know, that's how the Holocaust started. They, they went for our money first. They went for our property, our businesses. The final solution came a little bit later. Meanwhile, Fritz is still in Holland. Um, here you see him uh, probably the last winter in his home. Um, strangely enough, thanks to the Italian Senator, I pointed out, who was his brother-in-law, um, they received this assurance from the letter signed by Mr. Himmler, who was chief of police, assuring the Italian government that um, my grandparents would be left unmolested in their home. The, the, the idea being, as long as they stayed in their home, they were theoretically protected. Um, which, of course, wasn't really true. And uh, here's a letter signed by a, an agent of Hermann Goering's called Goethe, where he's ordering the removal of several paintings from the house. One by one, Hitler and Goering's agents arrive to, one way or another, strip the house of all its uh, belongings. Uh, first, the, the important paintings went, uh, the, the, the silver that was in the safe room, and uh, eventually all the, the furniture, the tapestries, the, the mice, and everything went. Uh, eventually there was nothing left but uh, bare walls. What the Germans didn't take here, the uh, Dutch uh, collaborators took. Meanwhile, obviously my grandfather made a big mistake not leaving Holland when he could. And uh, he always thought that the Italians would um, be his sort of ace in the hole. And here, this almost went to prove his theory. This is a, a card from his brother-in-law, Orsini, saying, uh, great news, il duce, Mussolini that is, had, uh, you know, authorized your entry visa into Italy. Then, uh, the end of May in 1943, two SS officers arrive at the door and order my grandparents to, to pack. 
that they're leaving on the night train from The Hague. They think they're going to Italy. Um, in fact, the train goes to family silver collection. He refuses, and uh, they're put on another train, not quite so comfortable this time. They still have 14 trunks of clothes and belongings, by the way, and um, my grandmother is wearing one of her many ankle-length fur coats, and my grandfather is wearing, a, I found uh, the documents that through the Red Cross, he's wearing an ankle-length astrakhan coat and a very nice suit underneath it. But uh, this is where they end up in Theresienstadt, uh, in Bohemia, ironically, where the family originated from. Um, their arrival causes quite a stir. Um, as I say, my grandmother is in her furs, probably smoking you know, her <laughs> one of her very fancy cigarette holders. And uh, many inmates, this is how I was able to piece together this part of the story, which is in the book, of course, um, wrote about the arrival of this unusual couple. Normally, the trains arrived with hundreds of people crammed you know, in, in, with, with no water and anything. And uh, suddenly this couple arrived in one train just to themselves and they're driven into the camp in a, an SS limousine. They are not treated so well, obviously. My, my, my grandfather tries to teach English. He, he picks potatoes out in the field. He's beaten many times, they're still trying to get him to sign over what's left of the family estate and after a year the Gestapo give up and uh, he's beaten to death. And I, my father actually found an eyewitness report, this is one of the strange documents that were in those boxes that arrived in 1994. Um, and here you see my poor father after the war, a rather stern man who's um, Life hasn't gone his way. He was born with everything. Good looks, wealth, uh, charm. He was a great uh, sportsman, athlete. he just graduated from Cambridge. Uh, he was going to inherit a fortune. The world was his oyster. And then everything just blew up. Everything disappeared. He spent the first 10, 15 years after the war racing over you know from every country in Europe trying to find what might be left of the estate. Here's a rare occasion, you see me and my brother Nick, um, on one of the rare occasions he took us with him. I, I had no idea what he was doing. You can see a, one of the few statues the Germans didn't bother to remove from our home in Holland. He did, my, my dad was actually, compared to many others, very successful uh, in retrieving much of what had been in the collection. He probably retrieved about a, a third of it. Um, this lovely painting by Marco Ricci used to hang outside my bedroom um, in, in London, in Chelsea. It's now in the National Gallery in Washington. But unfortunately, the, the, the catch was the Dutch government forced him to buy this back, uh, as, as they did most of what had come from our, our collection. So the stuff the monuments men brilliantly found in the salt mines and castles and cellars all over, and then you know they were disbanded far too early and uh, they were sent home and they had to just uh, pass the buck. So they, they said, well, this is looted in France, this is looted in Denmark, we send it back to the new government wherever, and that's where the system broke down. Here is something that this lovely Lyotard still life is at the Getty Museum in, um, in LA, very near where I live, near my beloved Getty Research Institute, which has been the source of so many of the revelations I'm able to describe and write about in, in, in the Orpheus clock. This painting actually he got back for free. Horst <laughs> Ballard uh, helped him uh, smuggle this back out of Switzerland where it had been. And here you see poor dad, um, probably a year before he dies in Switzerland. He, he liked going back to Switzerland. He'd been at school there as a boy and he felt comfortable. He's even president, it's a kind of rare distinction, of uh, the only Swiss cricket team. <laughs> Bless his heart. Um, 
which brings me back to the boxes that his, that his uh, poor girlfriend shipped me and my brother. Apart from all the letters, there were many photos, uh, including three that apparently Horst Valar herself had taken during the war at great risk um, when the Germans weren't looking. There were three negatives of uh, what we deduced to be French Impressionist paintings. This one turned out to be a landscape by Dugas. Um, another Dugas here. Again, I'm still looking for this one. Please, if anybody ever sees this anywhere. The last, I, I, can, I found a document where the Germans confiscated this for my grandfather's storage unit in Paris. Uh, the end of uh, 1941, and it's not been seen since. The other Dugas I discovered um, in 1995 at UCLA in one of the art libraries there. They, the UC system was very helpful. They very kindly got me every book in the, there was on Dugas. UCLA, there were many that they didn't have, and they said, we'll get them from Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And said, so come back on Monday, and they, sure enough, eventually I found this. This painting had been lent to a billionaire who came from Chicago, and <coughs> lent this to an exhibition in New York at the Met. And that started what was basically the first art looting case in the US. And um, we were more or less successful. Here you see my brother and myself at the restitution ceremony at the Art Institute of Chicago. Today, the painting hangs still in Chicago, but with a plaque saying from the collection of Fritz and Louis Guzman, which that alone I'm extremely proud of. This was the third um, impressionist, the Renoir poetry. Turned out we had a lot of digging. Um, this was in the collection of some very obscure, secretive rum uh, heiress from Cuba. Uh, but she, this, she'd left this in storage in some horrible place we found uh, in South London under a very grimy bridge behind Waterloo Station. Go figure. And the painting wasn't in very good condition. The, the deal was that Sotheby's arranged for the settlement and uh, unfortunately it did, didn't go very well. We then found a missing Botticelli, a portrait of a young man, also from the family collection. We caught this at Sotheby's too in New York. Um, a settlement was hatched out. It was, it was very difficult. At one point they um, threatened my brother personally with a two million dollar lawsuit for a, the infringing on their right to conduct business, which means selling looted paintings, apparently. Um, anyway, we did get some kind of settlement. It wasn't ideal, but we were changing the law. And uh, after that, we went back to Holland. It occurred to me, based on all the research we'd done, we had to dig up stuff in Dutch archives, we kept on seeing references to the Guzman collection, which I thought meant something historical, something in the past. Yet, lo and behold, it turned out there were hundreds of pieces from the Guzman collection at that point in 1999 in the Dutch National Collection. Oh, well, um, we fought hard. Eventually, there was a vote in Parliament and uh, they set up a commission called the Eckhart Commission that voted that well, maybe the Dutch government after the war hadn't, you know, they, they'd stuck to the letter of the law they claimed, but maybe they hadn't been quite moral or just. And so I got an apology from the Minister of Culture and uh, they started to assemble about 230 pieces that came from our collection, some that my father couldn't afford to buy back and others that um, he never knew they had in the first place. This says, Mafal Guzman nimmt Platz, means Mrs. Goodman takes her seat or finds her place. This is this weird warehouse where they started assembling our, our, our goods from the Dutch embassy in Buenos Aires, uh, the Ministry of Finance in The Hague and museums all around. And here you see my aunt Lily sitting in her dear mother, my grandmother Louise's uh, 
chaise longue, you know, it was, it was quite a, an emotional moment, you know, so the cameraman went crazy, as you can see, Dutch papers. There were many, here, here's a good example, this, uh, another Renaissance portrait by Jakob Elsner, this went into Hitler's collection, the monuments men found it in, in the salt mines at Alsace in, in, in uh, northwestern Austria, and uh, went back to Holland and they just swallowed it up until 2002. There were many beautiful uh, antiques and uh, some fabulous tapestries like this. Most significantly, also some of the great pieces from our silver gold collection. Um, here this Baroque masterpiece had been in the Rijksmuseum all those years, unbeknownst to my poor father. So we got them back. Here's my wife and myself toasting our success. These are two, they're called the Pet Salt Cups. Uh, our family had acquired them from the Rothschilds in Frankfurt in the 19th century. Seemed like a fitting toast here to our success. Yeah, we were making a bit of history. Back home, though, after this, uh, I wasn't going to rest on my laurels. Um, I acquired all sorts of strange inventories from German archives, and there was one painting in it that bothered me. I didn't even understand what it was. It said, I thought it said Ein Stuck, a piece, but in fact it was by a painter called Franz von Stuck. Um, very odd painting for my grandfather to collect, but as I say, he had varied tastes. Uh, as it turned out, my grandmother hated this painting, and it was, <laughs> it was banished upstairs, which is maybe why my aunt never remembered it, my father never put it in any of his notes, but it was in one of the Nazi inventories I'd found. And uh, to make the story more strange, I finally tracked this down uh, in a private collection less than two miles from our home in Los Angeles. I entered into a dialogue with this collector, who, who shall remain anonymous, but it's a whole chapter about this in the, in the book. And apart from the dreadful fate of my grandmother particularly, which seemed to bother him, sorry, I actually didn't mention that after my grandfather was beaten to death in Terzinstadt, a month later my grandmother was uh, shipped to Auschwitz where she was uh, killed on the day she arrived. All right, so. Apart from the dreadful fate of my grandmother that seemed to weigh heavily on this collector's uh, mind, there is the, this story. Um, here you see the man who had the painting, Dr. Karl Brandt, with his wife uh, and uh, their two friends, Mr. Goering and Mr. Hitler, at their wedding. Uh, Dr. Brandt was not just any doctor, he was Hitler's personal physician on one of them and uh, one of the originators of the medical experiments. Uh, the British captured him at the end of the war, I'm very proud to say, and uh, he was eventually hanged. Good riddance. So this poor collector in LA, when I told him this story, he went, well, he, you know, he, he decided he didn't like the painting anymore. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it, you know, he felt like he had blood on his hands, literally, and so he took it off his wall and helped load it in the back of my old jack. And uh, so it's a perfect restitution. No money changed hands. This man just did the right thing. Pretty amazing. Then here's another painting. This was destined for Hitler's office, but stolen from um, under the nose of his agent in Paris. And then it just disappeared from sight. Uh, Hitler himself was furious because uh, he was waiting for this rosy-cheeked young man, uh, um, he never got it. Uh, I, I found dozens of letters, his, his lawyer threatened to sue the art dealer, and you know, <laughs> it, it's odd, the, the sort of modicum of normalcy that you, you find in these letters, as if uh, it's just a genuine, regular business transaction that somehow had gone awry. Anyway, oddly enough, this painting also surfaced in the States, uh, at Rutgers University, some, some strange uh, German expatriate art historian had donated it. Um, I suspect because uh, my father was on his uh, tail. 
and he donated it to Rutgers, which was, was odd because he didn't have any children, let alone one of university age at Rutgers. But uh, I think he wanted to get rid of the painting before somebody caught him with it, and uh, he got a tax write-off. Rutgers also, to their credit, they deliberated for about a year, and then they just gave it back as well. I mean, it was another very the way it should be done. They they apologised. You know, once we've gone over all the facts and figures, and they gave it back. It, it was uh, restitution the way it should be done. So. There are museums in this country who do the right thing. You know, there are others who will fight families like mine tooth and nail. I went back to Holland one more time, still realizing they haven't yet given us back everything. This, this is still going on to this day. Now it's, uh, you know, after the 230 odd, you know, now I have to fight for every cup and saucer of one case at a time. This uh, Pietà statue actually my grandfather had on the landing outside the boardroom at a private bank in Amsterdam and uh, here you see it uh, being recovered from Hermann Goering's train um, full of statues that they hadn't had time to hide before the, the American army arrived and the Germans fled so these two GIs turned it over to the monuments officers who figured out where it had come from, shipped it back to Holland. Yet again, it was given to a museum in uh, Utrecht, and uh, I had to fight for it. And uh, eventually, it, it, I found it in a Dutch file under the heading, Origins Unknown. So I had to set them straight. And this, you know, this is still going on. This, this is endless. The more I dig, the more archives and art books I examine, the more I realize belong to our family. So rather than getting closer to the end of my tale, it, it keeps opening up and getting wider. Um, so after this, I decided to turn my attention to my great-grandfather Eugen's collection, uh, the originator of all the Renaissance gold and silver. This is a, a 105-year-old photo from his there's actually a beautiful catalog done of several, about three, four hundred pieces from his collection. And um, I found the Nazi inventory where this is taken from my grandparents' home in Holland. And then I found the inventory when the Nazis turned everything over when they were arrested at the end of 1945. And lo and behold, this clock, amongst many other things, wasn't turned over. It turned out the, this Nazi dealer couldn't bear to part with what, what we now know is called the Orpheus clock. He buried it in the sands of Lake Starnberg, uh, south of um, Munich, and waited for the, the American soldiers to leave. And then his son smuggled it into Switzerland, and uh, it eventually ended up here, the Castle Museum in Stuttgart, which is where I found it. This was my first direct German case. I mean, they were going to tie me up in German paperwork. And for a while, it was, looked like I'd be in uh, probate court for three years. Thank God I was spared that you know, fate, worse than death. They decided to do the right thing. Again, I got an apology from the state minister. And there wasn't just this clock, there was also as I say, there were many clocks in the collection. There's this, the Reinhold clock, which unlike the Orpheus clock only has one dial, this extraordinary piece has nine dials. One tracks the sun and moon, one the tides, uh, one the seasons, there's one even that follows the Julian calendar. And so it's, it's just like a technological marvel of, of solid iron dials all amazingly missing each other encased in gold. So these two clocks came back and um, with this restitution I was able to, I sold them back to the museum and uh, they paid more than a fair price. Uh, this time Sullivan's and Christie's actually helped me. This, this is one of many aspects of my story. The, the big auction houses started off 20 years ago in a very adversarial position. Um, they were furious at what my brother and I were revealing about the way the art world does business. Um, today they both have vice presidents in charge of restitution who call me to Simon. There's a 
sculpture coming up, you know, next month in Paris. It's got your family name in the Provenance, you know, is it kosher? You know, it's like, well, all right, I'm going to look it up, and sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So the art world has, in my experience, changed for the better. Not all of them, but mostly. Anyway, so here's a lovely picture of the, the dial by Wenzel Jamnitzer, the master goldsmith from Nuremberg. And talking of Nuremberg, here you see me in the vaults of the German National Museum in Nuremberg. I'm sure they were that pleased to see me. Um, uh -huh. This I'm holding what I thought was uh, one of the many still missing pieces from the silver gold collection uh, called the Tetzel Cat, um, Tetzel Katze. Um, turned out this is a, a Victorian uh, copy. Mm. So they don't know where the original is. So, mm. uh, you know, one, one day I'll find it. You know, I, I keep looking and uh, I'm, I'm very honored to have found this path. You know, I used to be in the record business in, in another life, but um, this took over, this is now my calling, and uh, lo and behold, the languages I'd been taught as a kid suddenly came into uh, great use, and uh, I never understood why my father dragged me around every art gallery and museum in Europe as a kid, but now I know. Um, I'm familiar with all these painters. It was sort of buried deep in me, you know, um, but it, it's come out, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to finish, try and finish what my my father valiantly tried to do after the war against all odds. Um, he did recover about a third of the collection with his sister, my aunt Lily, as I said, is still alive, and my brother and myself, Nick and I, have recovered again, probably about a third of the collection. So there's still. 20 good paintings out there, um, a dozen silver gilt sculptures like this, and, a, and another 200 important antiques. So um, I've got my work cut out for me. But anyway, thank you very much. You know, and, and the book took a bit of work too. But I, I need to go back to my, my search, my hunt. But thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs>
Yes, true. So you've been doing this for 20 years. Yeah. Meaning you started about 50 years after the end of the war. Exactly, yes. Do you, do you have any insight, especially to the extent that you know what your father was doing when he was recovering portions of the collection, as to whether the passage of time made it more difficult or less difficult to get people to give things back? I think the passage of time has actually made it more easy. When my father was doing it, the, the bureaucrats he had to deal with in France, Holland, especially West Germany, were more often than not the same bureaucrats that had been there during the war, during the Holocaust. So they actually had something to cover up, which was their own personal behavior. Today, we're a generation removed. Also, um, there's more information out there today. My story is in large possible because of the fact that the US, British, and all the, the French the allies declassified all their wartime documents only 50 years after the end of the war. So all these documents didn't begin to become public until 1995. So today, you know, I went to Koblenz in Germany on the Rhine, and I ordered Goering's file, which was actually sh three shelves worth. You know, it was, you know, weighed half a ton, but you know, they, they weren't very happy. But it was made available to me. My father could not possibly have been, that wasn't legally possible in those days. So he just had to bang on doors, not at random. He was actually very good at what he did. He he, he was on the trail of. of, of the heirs of the, the, the Nazi looters. He knew who they were, and he was actually very good at what he did. But you know, the resistance to what he did. After the war, people said, "Look, we've won the war. You're alive. Consider yourself lucky." Was 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 in a nutshell. You know, or we all suffered. Was another kind of euphemism that was thrown at him. You know, and we've all got to just pick up the pieces and move on. I mean, they, you know, my father would say, "Well, I don't think." anybody else suffered the way the Jews did, but um, no, nobody wanted to listen. So um, certainly not the Dutch government. They, they leant back on concepts. They said, we're a democratic country, therefore we can't make laws that single out Jews. <laughs> so it was, their, it was their way of not um, doing any kind of affirmative action to compensate for what had happened during the occupation years. So I think today, by and large, you know, my task is much easier than my, my father's, <coughs> partly because public opinion has changed, I think, often for the better, and, and we have more information, more facts to, to deal with. And as I said, the auction houses, the art world, some of the art world has finally kind of come to road. Well, one, that they couldn't get away with pretending that it never happened, but also they now realize a good example is the Klimt restitution, um, that a hundred million dollar painting now can come back on the art market, whereas before it was locked in a museum. So it's actually good business as well. Which uh, good business plus morality is a you know win win. <laughs> if uh, if your family had three hundred modest homes that they rented out to ordinary people back when all of our families were with them, many of our families were with them here. And they were stolen in the same way. Yes. And your grandfather was forced to sign over these to 300 modest families. And we come along 50 years later, and we go to the people that now live in those homes, and they say, you know, your, your, your chain of title is very good. Is the analysis different because this is beautiful art instead of identifiable but more uh, ordinary objects? Um, well, in a pure in a pure legal sense, no, there is no difference. Theft is theft, and uh, they didn't just take my family's paintings; they took. Um, the kitchen pots and pans, the cars were taken, the dogs disappeared, the rugs went, the beds went, everything went, and including the businesses, um, and yes, people's uh, apartments, shops, everything went. I focus on 
a Botticelli because it's much easier to identify and also it, it, it's something that isn't quite essential whereas a, a shop, a business has been occupied since the war by an indigenous family who are not usually willing to turn it over. It's a, it's a government issue and uh, in, in Germany that involves uh, the, what was the West German government dealing through the Jewish Claims Conference and um, the, these are not easy things to negotiate, navigate, uh, the paperwork, the legalities are such that they, they try and deter you from claiming in the first place. Uh, and most people, of course, in the years after the war, was the survivors were so damaged, the last thing they wanted to do, I and mean, that's why I think my, something like my father was extremely brave to go back to Germany and knock on doors. Um, that was the last thing in the world he wanted to do. I mean, I, I have one memory as a kid of actually being driven right across Germany in one day, and uh, he, he even refused to stop for me to go to the loo. He said, no, 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 we're, we're not getting out until we get out of, you know, through the other end. So it, it's very tough. Um, there, there are countries like Poland that haven't begun to even uh, tackle the, 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 the issue of uh, Jewish real estate. 10% of Warsaw was it, it owned by uh, Jewish families before uh, the German occupation. They, they don't know. It's, it's so big. The problem is so big. They haven't begun, you know, to, 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 to chip away at it. I have claims for all sorts of property in um, Germany, and the, particularly in the former East Germany. Uh, you know, legally these, these are very complicated. Um, they're all, I think, from a you know moral point of view, essential that we pursue every, you know, at least everything I can. I mean, I've, I've had two battles with the Swiss Banking Federation. Um, it's not just art I'm looking for. It's just it's easier to find a Renoir than it is a, a, a missing insurance policy, because I don't even know which insurance company it was written with. That, that's the thing. Questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you helped by the outcome of the two Washington conferences in the mid-90s that Actually, it seems to be obliged to judge among other states to cooperate. Was that the turning point? Yes, that, or that's. Had it already begun to soften up before that? No. Um, I mean, to be honest, when I found that Duga in, in, in Chicago, it, it had never been done before. That was the first case in the US. The second case was the uh, friends of my family, the grandchildren of Paul Rosenberg from Paris, who found a uh, a, a Matisse of theirs in Seattle, uh, and, and we, we discovered we were the tip of the iceberg. And then there was the famous portrait of Wally, which was confiscated by the, the Attorney General of the State of New York. All of this led to the Washington Conference in '98, of which I, I spoke at, and uh, I was using one of the examples. Um, and then after that, they issued the Washington Principles, based on the Washington Principles. Holland and Austria created restitution committees, so did France, other countries less so. The, the English had a spoilation, you know, council that actually is it, 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 less easy to deal with than, you know, I'd rather deal with the Germans than the English on this. Um, it, it, it's odd, but um, so it all changed in 1999, and most. Uh, Museums in the U.S. signed on to the Washington Principles, where they would, the, the concept being that they would examine their collections um, specifically for any artworks uh, that had changed hands during the Holocaust era. So any artwork of uncertain provenance, and uh, you know some museums are better than others. In L.A., we still have the Norton Simon to this day, fighting tooth and nail. Um, my friends, the, the heirs to the house sticker collection, who was, was a great Amsterdam art dealer. His gallery was next door to my father's bank. So when my grandfather bought that Leotard, which I showed you, that's now in the Getty. So it, it all changed. 99, it's, you know, it, it, it's a big sea change as well. This is, again, 50 years after the war. And people like my father had nothing like this to fall back on. Uh, yes, the doors were opened.
but I mean, still, they're, they're voluntary suggestions, not everybody. And even now, the, the Dutch Restitution Committee is trying to close its doors. They, they've had enough giving things back, and uh, they, they'd like to uh, call it a day. And, and the French, well, sometimes, you know, they, it, it depends what day you catch them on. <laughs> What kind of documentation did your great grandfather, great great grandfather have for documenting that this was in their property? Was it was it family documents or was it what the Germans recorded when they took out? Most of it were our family documents were mostly destroyed. Um, I did find a copy of my great grandfather's catalogue, which showed what he owned in 1910. So that was a big start. Otherwise, uh, mostly I've had to rely on Nazi documents. Um, I, I have several very accurate inventories, literally room by room. They say, you know, hallway, um, salon to the left, stairwell, even going, the etchings going up the stairs, you know, a vase at the corner. It's all, you know, this is the, you know, you have to thank the German Nazis for, for being this sort of anal about them. Um, I mean, they were very accurate and they did it in triplicate. And they didn't really think they were doing anything wrong, is the point. They thought it was all perfectly legit, which is why, you know, I mean, after the war, you know, they said, oh, no, uh, I, I, I paid him, it was all, I got a contract, he signed it, you know. Um, the fact that he was threatened with literally, you know, losing his life if he didn't comply. I mean, you know, the people in, in all the occupied territories desperately trying to bargain their way out. And in most cases, it didn't work. Usually you, you paid whatever they, gave them whatever they wanted, and then you were still arrested. So, um, um, yeah. Uh, and, and, and today I found things in Google Books, in, all, all, all over, you know, we, we have the internet, uh, as I say, the U.S. National Archives of the, the, the wartime section, the Ardelia Hall collection, which deals with Holocaust era um, looting is fast, and most of it's been digitized now, so there, there's a huge supply of information. Google Books, if I put in Eugen Gutsmann, it throws out 12,000 suggestions at me. I mean, a lot of it's nonsense, but it, a lot of it is, I, I found one where it told me exactly where he bought the Orpheus clock in Paris in 1898. So, um, you know, I know who he bought it from and all that. It's in some old book on page 98. So, you know, I mean, the, the, what, what we have at our fingertips today is quite different and, and fantastic. So what I do is it's kind of a modern story in a way. Actually, a little bit of a personal question. I'm getting so angry sitting here in this chair, hearing what you've been through. I mean, it's just so horrible. How do you live with dealing with these people that aren't honest? How do you do that and then not be enraged all the time? Well, I'm often enraged, but I'm also. <laughs> Re reassured by, as I say, the, the man who gave me back the Franz von Stuck, the, uh, even the, the museum in Stuttgart. I mean, I've come across a lot of very decent people as well. And as I say today, there's a vice president at Christie's who calls me up and says, Simon, um, I've got these two sculptures, can you check on them first? And uh, so there are a lot of good people out there as well. And, and this tempers the sort of evil resistance that um, I encounter, but even when I encounter that resistance, I'm I'm still uncovering my family's story, and that in itself is actually very very rewarding. So I understand that there are a lot of evil people out there. Um, they don't manifest their evilness as much today as they did, obviously during the Holocaust era. But you know, we're, they were human then, and we're still human now. So. Um, it's part of the story, and I, I'm grateful that I, I have this opportunity of recreating what has almost disappeared. So, so that's a big reward in itself. And then, you know, when, when something good happens, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's worth its weight in gold, and sometimes it, it just... <laughs>
just a few comments. Yeah. My first thought when I did started to listen is uh, just immediately remember the recent movie about the Austrian woman who was fighting for to retrieve her. Uh, about, uh, sorry? The no, yes, yes, the, the claim interest uh, Maria Halfman, yes. And she yes. went also to quite uh, significant efforts at the museum. Yes. Second, I uh, uh, just a uh, historical uh, reminded myself. When the Nazi reached Petr Petrgov, south of Leningrad, yes. they took essentially an enormous amount of art from there. And what is amazing, that you recovered almost two thirds what you think. And they, so Soviet Union, it's clear, but even today Russia is unable to recover this part of the, of the physical. And now some uh, small story which you, you just uh, show one picture, I think you say that Lieberman, yes. who was the head of the German Painting Society until right. 32, yes. yes. near Panze, where the notorious, uh, notorious castle when they, in 41, I think, made the famous, uh, Van Zelek, when they made the famous uh, meeting yes. about the, not very far from them is Lieberman's house. Yes. Beautiful my, museum. My, my, my cousins, the Arnholtz, who, who got out in time, had the villa next door. They, they run a very successful uh, <laughs> mutual fund in New York now, amongst other things. So they were the, one of the smart people. They got out in time. But yeah, Max Lieberman was from a great Berlin family. and. Uh, Today, the Max Liebermann house is next door to the Eugen Gutmann house in the Theresa Platz behind um, the Brandenburg yeah. Gate, opposite the um, American Embassy. So the, the Berliners, at least, are trying to honor the history they had, Ju Jewish history, Berlin Jew, that they almost eradicated. But uh, I don't know what to say about the, the Russians. Uh, they, they, they stole so much that they don't feel any impetus to look for what was stolen from them is, is the only way I can reason it. Um, you know, yes, there's the whole amber room that's still missing. There's Lord, Lord, Lord knows what. Um, and now we have these phantom trains in, in tunnels in Silesia that's full of, wow. <laughs> I, look, I, I, I've made this my life, and not everybody has the time or is prepared to do such a thing. So it's it's very hard work, it's very time consuming, and you have to be completely motivated to pursue this, otherwise it, 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 it doesn't work. So it's, it's not easy, it's not for everybody. Can you explain the procedure in contact and say in the museum, yes. do you think that they have a painting? Yeah. Uh, what, what are the steps that it does? Do you send the documentation? you go for a meeting? Yeah. Well, fir first what I do is I find, starting with the boxes my father left me, and then everything I found in German archives, American archives. I put art books today, you know, that I found in the Getty Research Institute. Everywhere. I put together a huge portfolio of every document I can find about the history of that painting or artwork. Then I go to them and say, this is the story. This painting, whatever it is, you know, sculpture came from my family and I believe you don't have it legitimately. What are you going to do about it? We can talk, we can, you know, things can get ugly, things can, uh, or, or we can resolve this in, in, in the way it should be. But, you know, our, our reason, look, you've had this over half a century for free, usually. Cons yeah. You know, count your blessings, consider yourself lucky. Now it's somebody else's turn, you know, do the right thing. And so, more often than not, by being an individual who's the grandson, who's the rightful heir, as opposed to, I started off by hiring a lot of fancy lawyers with my brother, and to be honest, that didn't work so well for us. Because when you hire a hotshot lawyer, they have to go and get their hotshot lawyer. And then they're going to bring up some weird law nobody's ever heard of before as to why they don't have to do this thing. That, as a human, me, on the other hand, as the heir, as the family, I can cut through that and say, look, this is a human story. Um, and sometimes I, I get through to people. You know, but yes, I start off by documenting my case. 
as thoroughly as I can. So I, when I went to Rutgers, I had a thing, you know, like a telephone directory, if people remember those. And, you know, I said, this is the story. And they were dumbfounded. They, they had nothing. They spent a year looking for, well, what, what could we find? And then they, they're coming back and said, well, we can't find anything to contradict your, your, your statements. So, so yeah, the more facts you can, uh, as I say, today, the internet, it's amazing what you can find. Fold 3 has digitized US wartime archives. Cost me 99 bucks a year, but it's, it's well worth it. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, sir, sir, you touched on this in general terms, but to follow up, uh, any evidence, any indication that large portions or any portions of the family collection went east with the Soviets and around post Soviet hands? Uh, just a general appreciation, yeah. perhaps for the next generation. Yeah, yeah. Will be working yeah, on that, that, that's a very good point. I mean, actually, my father was always told after the war by the West Germans that they didn't have it, it had probably gone to the East, and uh, which is kind of why he never, certainly never looked in the US, who the, were the Allies. He always assumed that everything was, if not in East Germany, in Russia. And my aunt, as soon as the communism fell, did write to both the Pushkin Museum and the Hermitage Museum, um, inquiring about things we, some of the things we were looking for. And interestingly enough, she did get a reply saying, oh, madame, we, we know about your family collection, but we, we don't have any of it. But they did admit to having my father's, godfather's uh, collection of Rembrandt drawings. He'd been our, the, almost our neighbor. The, the, they were called the Koenigs family. They lived in Harlem, which was very near us in Holland. And uh, um, they weren't Jewish, but they were liberal anti-German bankers, and they were targeted as well. Koenigs disappeared under a train in Cologne in the middle of the war. And he, he had the biggest collection of uh, Rembrandt drawings in the world, and most of those to this day are still in Russia, and the Russians aren't budging. So they said, yes, we, we know who you are, we, we, we took a lot of things from, you know, things that were looted by the Germans were re-looted by the Red Army at the end of the war and went back to Moscow and Leningrad. Um, I don't think anything from my family's collection is amongst those, but um, we're, I'm lucky, we're lucky, uh, because dealing with the, the Russians to this day is, is next to impossible. So, same thing, you know, at first I thought, oh, there's going to be stuff in Argentina or, you know, South America. As it turned out, next to nothing has surfaced in, in South America. All the Nazis that went there went with fake passports and money. But they didn't take any, you know, serious artworks with them or they would have probably been caught at customs somewhere. So, um, I would have thought by now something would have appeared in Buenos Aires or Asuncion or but no, oddly enough, nothing of significance has appeared in South America either. But the Russians have ton, tons of stuff, but they're not giving it back. They, they nationalized, they passed the law in the Duma, um, and they consider it reparation for what they lost during the war. Uh, in your journey, or are you aware of other groups that uh, help families who are less fortunate than yours? Finding restitution, or some of their possessions that are lost during the war? Um, yes, I, I mean, I, I find a, a lot about other families' collections in, during my research. There, there, there's a loose association of families that are still in this quest of mine, and we share information. Um, I work very closely with a, an organization in New York called the HCPO, the Holocaust Claims processing office and I, I do um, free research for them, genealogical things to prove um, that somebody is the rightful heir because that's a very big issue when you, you know your great grand uncle ha had, a, had a nice pizza hall painting over the fireplace but you know you have to prove you're the rightful heir which is not, not easy 
So, so I help, I work with the HCPO for, um, and they work as pro bono lawyers as well, by the way. So there, there, there are some mechanisms for helping families that don't have, you know, financial wherewithal, certainly to hire expensive researchers or attorneys. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, my friend Randy Schoenberg, who did the Clint restitution, also gives back a lot as well. Um, with his newfound wealth and he has time on his hands. Um, yeah, I mean, will we understand that uh, not every family was wealthy to begin with, but, but we all suffered sort of equally in a sense. And um, yeah, there's a moral responsibility, sure. Um, I have a question about the Clinton Trust. Um, I mean, how, how, how can they help? Well. You can, you can write the book, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell all your friends, and uh, next time you're in LA, if you read any German, you're welcome to the, come go through my shed and help do some filing, which I, I still have, um, well, 400 pages from Gulling's file that I haven't been able to touch yet. But, you know, I, I, I do what I can. It's, it's difficult. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.